All right, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. God, thank you so much for another Lord's Day that we can gather together as a church family, that we can uh, practice those things that you've uh, so graciously given us to do, encouraging one another, spurring one another on to loving good deeds, to speak the truth in love, uh, to pray for each other as we're able on this day. God, even to sit numerous times today and hear your word opened is a tremendous privilege, and to do that without fear of persecution or trouble. God, we thank you for such a privilege. God, I pray for my friends uh, in this uh, equipping hour, that you would give ears to hear, that you would grant just constancy of uh, attentiveness, and God, that you would, even for me, grant clarity as we dive back into uh, more teaching from your word on sanctification. Uh, your, your word just proves to be such a treasury for this subject and instructs us so thoroughly, sufficiently, how to make progress toward godliness. And we know this glorifies you. We know you love to put your grace on display in a transformed life. And so I pray that these words this morning uh, from this passage would be help to do just that, that we would put your character on display uh, for those in our homes, for coworkers, for neighbors, for a watching world, and that you would make us distinct, uh, make us different or holy as a result of receiving your instruction from your word, also that you might be glorified in the world. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, we are back in this equipping hour series on sanctification. This will be part 13 of who knows how many. But I want to just catch us up to speed and remind us of exactly where we've been with this series, what initially prompted this multi-round um, series in Equipping Hour on this subject of sanctification was something that I commonly encounter even at our church in, in counseling. Uh, people know that they have some trouble in their lives. They're aware of some sin struggle. We don't usually need much help as believers uh, identifying weaknesses or feeling them when they arise. And yet when folks have been looking for help, when I've investigated what's being done about those things, usually the answer is I'm reading my Bible and I'm praying about it. And that's great. It's a, a great start. We should live there as believers. But what does Bible reading and prayer, how do you actually make those things effective in your life? Uh, it seems to me that the connection between those means of grace and how to think about appropriating God's means for change and making them actually effective in our lives is just an area that we could grow in as a church. And so we began this series just answering the question, what is sanctification? What is it even? And here was my definition. Sanctification is that God wrought comprehensive but gradual conformity to Christ's likeness, which follows conversion and originates in the heart as the child of God actively submits his will to God by faith, all for the glory of God. That is 
one way to think about sanctification. There's 10 different elements included in that definition, and I'll just run through those briefly by way of review. Sanctification is God wrought. That means God is the one doing the work. We started in 2 Corinthians looking at this very thing. If you want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we can get our eyes back on this passage. Notably in verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says that this all comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. And so this is all from God. There is a sense in which the believer is engaging in something passive when he pursues sanctification. We cannot, we do not have the ability to ultimately change ourselves. We are completely dependent on God for that. All of our striving, all of our effort, all of our understanding that eventually leads us to or results in a transformation of life that is ultimately from God. We owe him praise for any change that occurs in us. And so this is God wrought. It is also comprehensive. Sanctification is not just dealing with one aspect of your life. It is not merely a change in behavior. It's not merely a change in your emotions. It's not merely a change in your decision-making ability. Sanctification is comprehensive. So it deals with all of those things and more. It deals with the will. It deals with what you do with your bodily members. It deals with your thought life. It deals with your affections, what you love, what you prefer, what you choose. It's comprehensive and it's gradual that from glory to glory is a description of degrees. We go from one degree of glory to another degree of increasing glory as we are being gradually transformed into the glorious image of Christ. And so it is conformity to Christ likeness. This always follows conversion. No unconverted person can make any progress in sanctification. This is why with your friends, with your unbelieving family members, don't bother teaching them to make progress in sanctification. If the gospel has not been believed, if Christ's lordship has not been submitted to if God's word is not accepted as what it really is, God's word, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, which is at work in you who believe. God's word works in those who first believe him. And this originates, just to point out the sixth element of this definition, in the heart. This originates in the heart. It is from the inside out. It does not begin with the behavior, but it begins at the heart level. The things you love, the things you believe, the convictions you hold, what you are determined to do at the heart level, that is where true chance transformation takes place. That is the beginning of it. And this belongs to every single child of God. Anyone who has been radically converted by the spirit in regeneration who has been adopted by God, sanctification characterizes their lives. You may not always feel it. You may not always see it. This waxes and wanes uh, throughout the Christian life. But this is as certainly as justification belongs to every child of God, as, so, as certainly as adoption belongs to every child of God, so also does sanctification belong to every child of God. And this eighthly requires an active submission of the will to God. This does not happen by accident. It requires you, Christian, to intentionally, with knowledge, as we'll talk about later today, bring your will 
in submission to God's will, that whatever you want, you prefer more God's desires for you. And so you actively bring yourself as a creature and as a redeemed son of God under the authority of your good heavenly father. And this occurs by faith. Ninthly, this occurs by faith, all for the glory of God. This, uh, over the next few weeks, four weeks, we'll deal with that very element that this all happens by faith. You are not sanctified by your emotions. You are not sanctified by merely remembering or recalling some beloved truth of scripture. You're sanctified by faith. That is the mechanism on which sanctification turns. We'll talk more about that over the next few weeks. And this is all for the glory of God. This is not for your comfort. This is not for the good of those around you. This is not primarily for even the good of the church, even though it is for that. This is primarily for the glory of God. Matthew 5, 16, do, let your good works be done before men so that they might see them and glorify your father who is in heaven. God ought to receive praise from our righteousness, not us, but him. We moved on from describing what sanctification is. We spent parts two and three talking about the priority of holiness. Nothing in scripture would lead you to come to any conclusion except to think that the priority of the Christian life is holiness. That is God centered, God glorifying holiness of life is the singular goal of the Christian life. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says this very thing. Let me just reread that for us. This is how Solomon ends this incredible book about all the vanity that man pursues under the sun. And so far from pursuing those vain things, making those the aim of life. He says the conclusion or the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man or because this applies to every person. The singular duty of man given to us by God is to fear him and keep his commandments. Another way of saying that is, God fearing obedience, sanctification, is the goal of man, the goal of the Christian life. Paul's ministry in Colossians 1 demonstrates that very same thing as the, the apostle says that he makes this same thing, God fearing obedience, his goal in all of his labors. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, I also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So Paul took up the right methods, the right motivation and the right means in his apostolic ministry as a minister of the gospel and this is what he set out to do, to make every man complete in Christ. That's a description of Christian maturity. We then went on to lay out 20 convincing proofs that our holiness is God's priority. I won't run through those all. That was part three. Just various truths spanning the totality of Scripture, Old and New Testament, showing that God's priority for us in everything he's written is aiming at our holiness of life. And then we moved on to part four, a foundation for holiness. The foundation on which all holiness stands is the gospel. It is Christ's sacrifice. God's will, this Trinitarian work of God in redemption, the father purposing, desiring, willing Christ's sacrifice Christ coming and 
fulfilling the will of God, accomplishing the will of God by laying down his life and sacrificing himself. And the spirit who empowered that same act demonstrates that this was all intended for our sanctification. Hebrews 10, 10 through 14 demonstrates that God's will is consumed with making us holy, holy in our position before him and holy in our practice in this life. Philippians 2 demonstrates that we have a part to play in this work of God in making us holy. So again, we are not passive in this. This is not a let go and let God, hey, I'm praying about it. I don't have anything else to do. I'm waiting for God to change me. That is not a faithful representation of what God is doing in the Christian life. He is doing the work, but you are striving to get it done. And that's what Paul communicates in Philippians 2, that it is him who is working, causing us to both will and work according to his good pleasure. And so we talked about those two foundational factors for Christian obedience. We have a clear obligation to obey and a divine motivation to obey, which is God's own working in our lives. And then finally, we finished that first round with talking about the sanctifying effects of beholding God's glory. God's glory is sanctifying. God's glory is sanctifying. As you, Christian, aim to draw near to the word of God, to behold the God of the word, he uses that increase in knowledge as you behold and stand in awe of God's character you behold his greatness. He uses that to transform you by degrees as you recognize the greater distance between God, who God is and who you are. As you marvel at the wisdom of his commandments, the graciousness of his character, the mercy that he's demonstrated to you in the gospel, his ongoing patience with you as a believer He uses all of those things to compel you to look more like Jesus in your walk of life. We then took up this second round of of this series to look at uh, a study of hamartiology, the study of sin. We, We answered the question in seven different ways, why even study sin? Sanctification demands it. Scripture encourages a study of sin. The cross includes a study of sin. You can't understand the gospel without studying sin and coming to see sin in greater degrees. Uh, The new nature allows you to finally study sin properly. Heart shepherding requires that you study sin. If you're going to change at the heart level, you have to better familiarize yourself with your own propensities to sin with what's motivating you or what you're not being motivated by that's allowing you to continue to sin. The church, we need each other to study our own sin and the sin of each other so that we can help each other come out of sin and glorify God. So heart shepherding requires it. The church needs it. And finally, one day we will not be allowed to study our sin anymore because we will be sin free. Praise God. And so in this life, we have a unique opportunity to study hamartiology. We spent the next two part, parts, eight and nine, discussing this uh, concept of practical atheism, that whenever we sin, we are engaged in practical atheism. The Christian is not an atheist. No one actually is an atheist. Everyone knows that God exists. The Christian is just one who has ceased to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so now instead of denying God's existence, we love his existence. We love to discover who he is. We love to consider who he is. But every time we sin, it is a practical turning away from that knowledge of God. I would rather not think about who you are, God, so that I can engage in this sinful activity. Whether you're consciously, sinning or sinning 
in a way that you're unaware of or incidentally, this is still happening. And we looked at uh, two instances, if you will, uh, in the garden, the practical atheism that was necessitated in the fall. Adam and Eve had to practice this, turn a turning away from God, a denial of who they knew he was in order to take the fruit, break his commandment and believe the serpent, Eve, Adam knowingly be deceived and, and follow his wife into sin. And then we looked at the, just really the logic of practical atheism that God who reigns as king, anyone who's going to refuse to submit to God as a pattern of life or in a moment, if God is the king, he's the one giving the law. The one who refuses to submit as a pattern of life or in a moment at the heart level, that is synonymous with removing the king off his throne and setting myself up as an authority. And anyone who would self set himself up as an authority, you think of a, a king in a kingdom, the one who wants to make the rules has to be king. When we do that, when we pretend to be autonomous, then at the heart level, that is us demonstrating hostility toward God the king. We would just as soon as sin remove him from his throne so that we could be autonomous and lay down a law for our, ourselves. This is seen most clearly in the gospel. This is exactly what Jesus described was happening or going to happen in Matthew 21. God had given out this vineyard to stewards and sent them servant after servant, those servants being the prophets, to collect what he owed, owned from his own vineyard, that is Israel. And what did they do? They abused, they killed the prophets, but they, he finally sent the son. And what did they do when the king came in the flesh? They killed him so that they could maintain authority over the vineyard. And that practically played itself out when Jesus, God the king, became in flesh, incarnate. What did man do? We killed him. That is proof positive that if we could kill God in our sin, we would kill God so that we could continue engaging in the sinful deeds that we love in our natural state. That is the heart of practical atheism. Practical atheism made the gospel a reality, the death of Jesus a reality. And then we just played this out in, in part 10, diagnosing sin. This is something that we all must practice if we are to make true progress in holiness. We must be able to diagnose our sin at the heart level and discover what practical atheism is lurking underneath or behind our besetting sins. Whatever the sin is, and we went through four of them just as test cases, if the sin is self-righteousness, is this, if the sin is a lack of teachability, if the sin is a fear of man, if the sin is anxiety, or any other sin you could add to that list, we must be able to, with precision, diagnose what's happening at the heart level. Where's the practical atheism? What am I not believing about God that is true? And what am I believing about myself or others, or God, that is a lie, I must be able to target those things at the belief level, and then with the scriptures, as we'll see, overturn those wrong beliefs. That is how you make progress in your sanctification by faith. Target the lie, identify the lie, and then search the scriptures for what is true, and then determine to believe that, resolve in your heart to believe that instead of whatever lie that you've been believing. And we don't need help believing the lies. We don't need to sit down and think of them before we sin. They just flow out of our mixed heart, our heart that's in this mixed condition, not perfected yet, not glorified yet, 
we just tend this way, like your car when it's out of alignment, turning the wrong way. This is what our hearts do naturally. And so it takes constant realignment with the truth, daily meditation on what's true, so that those thoughts that come so naturally to me get overturned by the supernatural thoughts that I am discovering from God's word that I'm meditating on day and night from the scriptures. This is how we make progress in our holiness by faith. And it's what you must practically do with each other. As you sit down to help a brother or sister with some blind spot in their lives, and we all have them, when someone steps into your life, you want them to be so informed by the wisdom of God from the scriptures that when the lies that you've been believing just spill out of you in conversation, they can say, wait, can, I, can we back up a little bit? Can I ask you about that? What you just said here, what do you mean by that? And as you articulate what your heart's been believing that you've been unaware of, they can say, let me actually tell you what God's word says about that. Stop thinking that way. Stop believing that. Start believing this. Remember what God says? And you'll go, oh, yeah, that's right. Thank you. The first time. <laughs> Hopefully. The, the, the final couple uh, lessons, parts 11 and, and 12, we talked about hypocrisy and just nine thoughts for crucifying hypocrisy, we, we can all fall into the trap of being hypocritical where our profession far surpasses our practice. And we, we even get into a, a pattern of that at times. We want to stay far away from that because hypocrites do not inherit the kingdom of God. And so in light of the fact that repentance is rare, that God sees the heart, that my view is limited, that man's approval is meaningless, that sincerity requires right motivations, that little sins can condemn us, that biblical instruction sanctifies and saves, that the day of the Lord is coming and the kingdom will be glorious. All of those truths are powerful motivations to put away hypocrisy. And then finally, the, the hope given and the fact that there are some few advantages to remaining sin is what we looked at finally. Uh, that Again, that title being taken from John Newton's, uh, one of his letters, the title of one of his letters as he counseled a friend to think about the advantages from remaining sin so that we don't despair. Uh, and that really came down to two things in God allowing us to remain in this mixed condition where we actually have to fight, strive and struggle to put off sin. That gives two advantages. One, the heinous nature of sin is exposed and two, the glorious character of God is revealed. As you fight against your sin in this life, day after day, week after week, making incremental progress, always less than you would like to make, certainly. Then we come to have a new appreciation of the heinousness of sin, which inherently means we should be coming to a greater view of the gospel. He who has been forgiven much, loves much. And then we get to see again, the glorious character of God revealed as we understand how gracious he's been, how patient he is with us, how kind, etc. As I mentioned over the next four weeks, what I want to do is make uh, for us a strong connection between faith and sanctification to understand how faith practically functions in our sanctification. To do that this morning, we're going to look at one passage, Titus chapter one, go to Titus chapter one.
in Titus chapter one. And I hope that this will be a, a further encouragement to slow down at the opening greetings of the epistles. Those have tremendous, tremendous value for you, for me. Look at what Paul says in Titus chapter one, just the introduction, Paul, dot, 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 verse four, to Titus. Paul to Titus. That is the main point of the opening of this letter is that my name is Paul. I'm writing to a man named Titus. He doesn't get there until four verses later, though. And what we need to see is how Paul's apostleship demonstrates the inseparable connection between three components of sanctification. Look again at verse one, Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word and the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our savior to Titus, my true child in common faith, grace and peace from God, the father and Christ Jesus, our savior. Paul's apostleship demonstrates the inseparable connection between three components of sanctification. As Paul has delegated to Titus the responsibility of getting the churches in order on the island of Crete, namely, firstly, by appointing elders in those cities. He does that by placing an emphasis on his own apostleship. The, the three components of sanctification that we need to see this morning, and I'll just give them, tell you all of them up front, they're faith, knowledge, and hope. Faith, knowledge, and hope are the three inseparable components of sanctification, all flowing out of Paul's apostleship in this passage. These have an inseparable connection, all contributing to the sanctification of the believer. As Paul emphasizes his own apostleship, the purpose for which he was given apostleship and the basis for which he was given this apostleship, he's describing three crucial components that cannot be separated. They all walk hand in hand for the believer as he tries to make progress in this area of Godliness. And for Titus, being given these words by Paul, that would have been a reminder, a signal for everyone hearing Paul's words to Titus that he has the authority and everything about who he is as an apostle. These men who were functioning as the foundation around Christ, the cornerstone of the church. This would have given him confidence and authority as Titus went about getting the churches in order on the island of Crete. And so Paul's apostleship is significant for his apostolic delegate Titus and all of the churches who are going to be hearing these words that Paul wrote to Titus in this letter. Just notice The first thing that Paul, the apostle calls himself is a slave of God. Translated a bond servant in the new American standard Bible. But that word doulos means slave. He is one whose will is completely bound up in the will of another, namely God. God's will dominates Paul's will in everything that Paul does in life. He is, he considers himself a slave of God. 
He doesn't get to teach what he wants to teach. He doesn't get to feel what he wants to feel. He doesn't get to go where he wants to go. He doesn't get to do what he wants to do. He is a man completely and wholly in submission to another. And so he calls himself a doulos, a slave. This is true of every single Christian. Your will is dominated by the superior, greater will of God. We are not our own. We are slaves of God, slaves of righteousness. And this one, Paul, who is a slave of God, is also an apostle of Jesus Christ. Think about the connection between these two things. His will is submitted to God, but he was sent by Jesus Christ. He's not intending to draw two completely distinct separated realities here as he brings his will in submission to God, as God directs Paul in all things, Jesus gets to send Paul. So clearly God, the father and Jesus must have the same will because as Paul submits himself to the will of God, Jesus is sending him as an apostle. He is a sent one, an apostle of Jesus, the Messiah. And as Jesus, you you discover, we discover something about the will of God and the will of Jesus as Jesus sends Paul the apostle to accomplish God's will in his apostleship. Because the next phrase demonstrates the very purpose for which Paul was appointed an apostle. This is the purpose for which Jesus sent Paul as an apostle to accomplish the will of God. What's the purpose? Two things. Faith. The faith of the elect or those chosen of God. And not only faith, but the knowledge of the truth, which is in keeping with or is according to godliness. So these two things, faith and knowledge, faith and knowledge. These are the first two components that cannot be separated in sanctification demonstrated by Paul's apostleship. Jesus sent him to accomplish the will of God. When he sends Paul to accomplish the will of God, Paul is laboring for First, faith. Faith. This is the faith of those who have been chosen by God. God, on his own, under no obligation from anyone else, decided to save some people. When everyone was running to hell, that's, that's what's happening practically when we are born into sin rejecting and hating the gracious offer of forgiveness from God. Everyone's running to hell away from God and God mercifully, graciously decides of his own accord to save some, to stop their pursuit of of his wrath and hell. And he rescues them, has determined to rescue them from that foolish pursuit. How kind of God. He elects, he chooses to give salvation to some of all of that mass of humanity headed to hell together. How does he rescue those individuals? Well, faith. Faith is how they come. Those who have been chosen by God come to be saved or rescued by God from their hellish pursuit. And so when Jesus sent the apostle to accomplish the will of God, he is going for faith. He is laboring for their faith. Not just a faith that saves. This is not the only faith. It's not just a one-time faith that Paul's aiming at. Glad that's over. My job is done as an apostle. But Paul continued laboring for faith. Even notice 
in chapter 2, as each category in, in Titus chapter 2, as each category of person in the body of Christ, older men, older women, younger women, younger men are mentioned, just notice in verse 2, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. They must be sound in faith. What they believe about God must include healthy teaching. It must be healthy, sound. And so this would have been a, a ongoing faith. As you believe, as you walk, older men, in faith, it must be sound, informed by sound, healthy doctrine, according to verse 1. Sound doctrine, sound teaching produces sound faith. And so the faith that Paul is laboring for, what he is purposing as an apostle, is faith that saves, faith that sanctifies. It's just faith through and through. He's aiming for that. This is the purpose of Paul's apostleship. And just notice, it's not just faith, period, but something else is connected inseparably so to that faith. It is in purpose, it shares a purpose. It is the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge of the truth. This is, this, this term knowledge means just simply that this is what you know to be true. So the truth must come. You must by faith lay hold of it and then know that. Just consider this, this same connection that's made in Hebrews 11 where the, the, the writer here highlights this same connection when he says in describing how we know things, Verse 3, Hebrews eleven three. 3, by faith we know or we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. How do we know things? By faith. It's the things that we can't see. Truths like Jesus, the sin of, that, that we committed being imputed to Christ. You can't see that. But as a Christian, you know it to be true. How do you know it? By faith. How do you know Jesus was resurrected? You've never seen him. You've never seen anyone else resurrected from the dead. You've never seen Jesus in bodily form. How do you know that he rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God, interceding on your behalf? By faith. That's how you know it. This is knowledge of the truth. All biblical teaching that's unseen fits into this category. This is knowledge of the truth, but it is believed by us, even though it's not seen by us. This is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Every truth that sanctifies the Christian is believed by faith. You can't hold it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, but you're taking God at his word that it's true. And so faith and this knowledge of what is true are inseparably connected. Also, just consider that you, you've never obeyed more than you know. You've never obeyed more than you've known. Name a single commandment that you've been unaware of keeping that you've intentionally tried to keep. Impossible. If you don't know it even exists, if you don't know it, that God requires it, then you can't intentionally say, okay, that thing that God requires, I'm going to go after it. You don't know it. And so we cannot obey further than we know. 
This is why Peter says that you must add to your faith knowledge in second Peter chapter one. Just go there. Second Peter chapter one, as Peter encourages a robust, confident, strong entrance into the kingdom. He says in verse five, or excuse me, second Peter one, second Peter one. Now for this very reason, verse five, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge and in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance, godliness and in your godliness, brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness, kindness, love. So he's talking about adding these things. This is growing in these things. It's not enough to just believe once and for all in conversion, but you must be pursuing these other points of godliness. One of which includes knowledge. This is why Paul was sent by Jesus as an apostle to lay down biblical truth. Sometimes that includes an articulation of old truths from the old covenant or old Testament Oftentimes for the church, it includes brand new instructions for the church. Paul, the apostle was sent by Jesus as God willed to accomplish these things, to establish faith and knowledge of the truth. And notice that this is truth, which accords to godliness, Truth which accords to godliness, that is by the standard of godliness, or it is in keeping with, in conformity to godliness. That means godliness that, that the believer should be after, this truth walks hand in hand with it. You can't find the truth without finding this accompanying godliness. You can't believe or know in the biblical sense this truth without possessing the accompanying godliness and you can't have the godliness without laying hold of the biblical truth. They go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. Paul's apostleship proves this. This was for the purpose. Paul was made an apostle for the purpose of faith, for the purpose of the knowledge of the truth, which is in keeping with godliness. And this was in the hope of eternal life in the hope of eternal life. So this brings uh, the third component having to do with our sanctification is hope, faith, knowledge, hope. And again, hope is a word that has to do with faith, something unseen. This hope is merely a confident expectation of a future reality, a confident expectation of a future reality that's what biblical hope is. This is not wishful thinking, but this is a, a, a certainty. So for the Christian eternal life, this thing that we have been granted by God, long life, eternal life, <clears throat> we possess it by right now. It's been given to us. We have a right and access to it currently but one day will be finally possessed in its fullness. When we finally see God enter the kingdom, possess glorified bodies with all the other saints, this day is finally coming, this eternal life, the fullness of it, the uh, actual possession of it tr in truth will be one day. This is still future. But the hope of it, that's exercised right now by every single believer. You have a confident expectation, and this to you now is as real as if you did have it now. What's coming is as real to the believer as if he was experiencing it right now because of this next phrase, because of God who cannot lie. God who cannot lie or God free from all deceit promised this 
and long ages ago. God determined to give eternal life, to bring about eternal life. An unending duration of life under his reign, with him in close proximity, and he determined long ago that man would rule the earth and that man would be God in the flesh. He would be the king of the world one day. Adam failed at that, at ruling and subduing the earth and perfectly imaging God to show all of creation what God is like as a king. Adam failed. And prior to that, God had already determined that long life, eternal life, would still be had. If you would span all of biblical revelation, that eternal life is what was proclaimed or promised by God. That is God as man ruling and subduing all of creation that is still coming. Christians and Christian, you have hope. You only have hope because of God's character. Notice God, Paul recalls, cannot lie, cannot lie. So when God makes a promise of eternal life, he cannot lie. God can no more deceive us than he can be deceived by us. That's good news. God promised this in uh, what gets translated as long ages ago <clears throat> or uh, literally before times of eternity or before times eternal. This is before the first day, before day one of creation, God had made this promise. He had determined to accomplish this. And then Paul says, at the proper time that eternal life was finally manifested his word in what the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God, our savior, God commanded his slave who was submitted completely to his will to make a proclamation. So Paul made that proclamation. This was the word of God and what was it? It was unveiling for his hearers this hope of eternal life, this eternal life itself, that God has promised eternal life to those that he has chosen who believe. So the manifestation spoken about in verse three at the proper time, this proper time is not a reference to Christ's coming or Christ's incarnation or his death on the cross, but the particular time when the gospel came by word of the apostle and to each audience where Paul traversed new uncharted territory with the gospel was God's proper time for those people to hear the word about eternal life. If you believe sinner, you can have eternal life. The long life that God has determined to bring to mankind one day, you can lay hold of it. You can have that right. You can have a right to it today if you repent and believe the gospel. If you bring yourself like Paul was in submission to the will of God, if you too wear the yoke of Christ and submit to him, then you too can have rights to this eternal life who the God who cannot lie has promised to all those who believe. That's the gospel. He put his son, God in the flesh, on the cross to secure eternal life for all of those who would believe. Do you believe? And those who said, yes, I believe the gospel. You Christian who have already said yes to that message, you possess faith, you possess a knowledge of the truth, and now you possess the same as you believe and the same as you know, you have hope. 
these things, these three components that are a part of Paul's apostleship, his ministry to believers of all time by virtue of, of him writing in the scriptures, this has to do with your sanctification. This has to do with, as he says in verse one, godliness, your godliness. The apostle John even, even mentions how all who hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. Believing the truth, knowing the truth, hoping in eternal life that is to come, these things purify and sanctify the believer. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at multiple passages that just help draw that out and hopefully practically help you learn better, get clearer how to do this in your own life and how to bring God's word to help one another be sanctified by faith, by the truth. That's what's coming over the next few weeks. Let me pray. God, thank you for these marvelous truths. Even thank you for so long ago choosing Paul to bring this word of hope and knowledge and faith to us. Words to be believed because they are on the basis of your immutable character. You can't lie. You can't be deceived. You can't deceive. And so I pray that that would be our only confidence this morning. Even as we think about you having communicated through a man, a fallible, flawed man in the apostle Paul, you did so in such a way that he, when he communicated your word for us in the scriptures was flawless, inerrant, you're, you're having your authority. So we take these words today, God, just asking for fresh supplies of grace to believe them, to know them, to lay hold of them as true and to stake all of our eternity on these words in even a renewed way today. And I pray for Grace Bible Church that you would strengthen us, empower us to increase in our competency to help one another so that we would all lay hold of eternal life so that we all might enter into the kingdom with confidence one day in the end. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.